Thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. I'm very excited to moderate this panel on trends and trust in CCS after a really energetic and exciting morning and introduction. And this panel really serves to drill out, it, it drills down into the policies, projects, and trends that we've seen and that we've discussed on a high level this morning. And as you know, the Institute's work is really focused on documenting what we're seeing globally on climate and CCS and leveraging these, development to, these developments to accelerate the deployment of CCS. And from my view, actually, and I've only joined about almost two years ago, I think the world is really ready for CCS for, to, for it to take, out, take off. And I think what's really exciting about today is only one year ago we hosted this forum and there were a lot of different people here. There are a lot of new people who haven't been here, who are here the first time. And it really shows that this, as Andrew put it, the, the loop of climate ambition or the ambition loop and the new allies are taking off. And then I think a few months ago at the Institute, and this is just in relevance to, to the panel today, we updated our project database, um, CO2 R core, which you can find on the internet. And we added 10 projects globally, eight in the US, which are um, a direct result of the LCFS CCS protocol, obviously 45Q, which we'll discuss, and um, sustained government support in the US. And they really stand for this next generation of CCS projects with hubs and clusters, new business models, new technologies, new applications, all of which we are discussing today. And then only three months ago, we launched our global status of CCS report, which has been one of our most successful, if not the most successful to date, and which has already been referenced so many times. So this is really exciting, but since then we've seen more commitments, more excitement, and more announcements. So let's discuss, and I'm really excited to be joined by experts and leaders today. To my left I have Dr. Julio Friedman, who's a senior research scholar at Columbia University. I think no stranger in this room. Um, Cindy Yielding from, um, Cindy Yielding, who's the senior vice president at the BP America. Ina Juan Ries, who's joining us from Equinor. She's the Vice President for Government Relations and Public Affairs. She's just arrived in the US a few months ago, so we were very excited from Norway. And then obviously, Claire, um, Rich Powell, who's the Executive Director at ClearPath. So, okay, let's start with, I think, Julio. Um, you've been doing this for a long time. Tell us a little bit, how has the conversation changed over the past 20 years, over the past decade, but also particularly over the past two, maybe one year since, you know, 45Q has really taken off. Uh, can everybody hear me? Thank you, Lee. Uh, delighted to be here, and thanks to the Institute for hosting this event and for inviting all of us up here, including myself. So, uh, uh, Andrew's talk began in 2008. Uh, I saw dark days before that, so uh, I've been in this business since 2001. And there was a real rush from 2001 to 2004 where it looked like we were growing projects and deployment and people got interested and we had future gen and zero gen and green gen and all these projects coming online. And then there was a second round of dark days. The round of dark days that came before the recent dark days went from 2005 to 2008. There was sort of this global moratorium on progress. Stuff just stopped happening. And... Um, it's not exactly clear why that was, but at that time, I built a tragic imagination around this uh, undertaking and uh, saw that, in fact, none of this stuff is inevitable. All of this stuff is hard, and you do have to build coalitions to make it work. And uh, in that context, a lot has changed over the past 20 years, and most recently. The most recent big change in the trend that uh, has mattered the most is just that people have finally done the climate math. And whenever I talk to people, I don't use the word math, I use the word arithmetic. If you can do arithmetic, you can figure this out. And we figured this out in 2001. It wasn't that hard. And in 2001, it was clear we weren't going to get there without CCS. And since then, the arithmetic has just got more and more difficult. Two pieces of that arithmetic have come into focus. One of those is around heavy industry. People have stopped... Uh, uh, sort of eliding that out of the system. And they, as we've made progress in power, and we've begun progress in transportation, people have turned their head to heavy industry and said, oh my god, that's so much harder than I thought. And at that point, CCS looks a lot more interesting. The other has already been talked about, but it bears mentioning again, the framework of net zero. Because zero is a very hard number to meet. And if you get to zero, and you emit anything, you must counterbalance that with removal. You must unemit whatever you emit to get to net zero. 
And that automatically brings things like bioenergy with CCS and direct air capture into play. And that is, uh, again, a place where even groups that have been pretty reluctant to consider CCS have begun to accept that change. Uh, there's two other, I think, big trends in this. And I don't want to take all the time because we've got a great panel. Uh, one of those is around just new opportunities that have been coming forward. Uh, hydrogen's already been mentioned as a big new opportunity. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to go to my website and take a look at a report we did on fuels for heavy industry. Hydrogen is one of those options that looks pretty good. You can move hydrogen into places directly today, and we're seeing hydrogen moving into shipping. Uh, in fact, Ecuador had the project, uh, a, a fuel cell project on ammonia just recently. We're seeing both green and blue hydrogen come forward. I gotta be clear about this, we gotta be colorblind about hydrogen. Like, as long, if it's blue or green, I like it. If it's black or brown, I don't. And, and let's keep our eyes on the prize. Any, any decarbonized hydrogen is a welcome hydrogen, no green hydrogen left behind. Um, the other is around a circular carbon economy. We just came back from Riyadh, and we've begun to see that this idea has taken hold of people's imagination. A circular carbon economy requires moving carbon molecules around, and that requires carbon capture, that requires some Geos geospheric return. And geospheric return has finally entered people's conf confidence in this. This gets to the third trend. I've seen CCS as an enterprise move from defense to offense. And Lord, that is so welcome. Uh, we've just been playing rope a for 20 years. And, and I think we're finally out of our huddle and out of our crouch. Part of that is that we've talked for 20 years about risks. And now we live in a world that is festooned with risks of all kinds, and actually the risks that CCS have are pretty low compared to a lot of those other risks. And that's very welcome. And I will elaborate now, we can talk more about that later. Another is that we've gone from broad ignorance on the topic of what will happen if we do CCS to one of really confident knowledge. We've just been doing it for a long time and that knowledge helps us. It helps us in discussions to say we're injecting 40 million tons a year and we've been doing it since 1996. We've been injecting CO2 underground since 1972. We know the risks and we know them well, and that's a good way to talk about it. Don't start by saying, well, we think earthquakes are something we can manage. Like, no, get out of your defensive position, get into offense. Yeah, we know how to do this. We do it well, and we have done it well for a long time. Um, in that exact context, CCS is inevitable. The arithmetic makes it that way. Inevitable is still a bad business plan. Uh, and you can lose a lot of money and you can die in the desert on inevitable as a business plan. And so the most interesting thing that's happening here, I'm going to leave it to the other people in the panel to talk about this, is the trends in finance. The fact that now there's ways to generate revenues doing the work of CCS is a big and welcome change and that really has pulled already a lot of capital and a lot of people off the sideline and into the main business. I'm going to stop with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julio. I appreciate your points on CCS as risk managing. Um, and in particular, I think you're also discussing your report on Thursday here in DC. Is that right? Yep. So uh, we've got another a separate report on decarbonizing the heavy industry, uh, and that we are indeed uh, presenting at ITIF on Thursday. Myself, my colleague David Sandalow, and if you don't know him, the mighty Colin McCormick will all be there. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, let's go over to Cindy, to you. Um, BP is really at an inflection point, I would say, with the new CEO and new commitments coming out. Can you tell us more about where the vision of the company for net zero by 2040? Okay, thanks very much. I uh, appreciate being here. I appreciate to, uh, the opportunity to speak on behalf of BP and also the National Petroleum Council study, if and when appropriate. So, um, so for BP, uh, if you remember sort of the very late 1990s, John Brown, Beyond Petroleum, you know, we, we took a very aggressive early stand, um, went out, uh, you know, kind of set a vision to, we didn't use terms like carbon neutral, but really to uh, lead progress into the 20th, uh, 21st century. And um, what came out of that, we learned a lot of lessons and we'll go through now, and we lost $9 billion, and we have a, um, a wind business that survived out of that. So um, I think everyone was looking to BP to make statements, and so uh, I think people have been kind of waiting a uh, you know, long time in coming, but our new CEO, Bernard Looney, uh, made some announcements about two weeks ago, and so I'll just quickly go through them. Um, so our purpose is actually reimagining energy for people and our planet. 
And our ambitions, we, we listed two big ambitions. One is to be a net zero company by 2050. And the second is to help the world get to net zero um, by cutting the carbon intensity of our products. So we then underpin those with 10 aims. Five of those are directed uh, sort of at in, internally at VP, and five of them are about helping the world uh, transform to um, a zero net carbon economy. So I'll just go through them very quickly. <laughs> so five BP aims, net zero operations by 2050. This addresses our scope one and scope two emissions. Uh, two, net zero across the upstream by 2050, uh, which starts to lead into our scope three emissions. And we were always very envious of Shell and their stand on scope three, and, and now we're, we're with you. and ready to learn with you, uh, you guys. Uh, three, cut carbon intensity of our products by, by 2050. Four, um, methane measurements uh, at all our major oil and gas processing facilities, uh, direct measurements by 2023. Um, we'll also publish the data and, and drive a 50% reduction in our methane intensity. Number five, for internal BP, uh, increase the proportion of our investments uh, into non-oil and gas um, activities. So for the world, uh, five more and I'll then turn it back over to you, Lee. Um, so take a, a much more aggressive stance on advocated advocacy for policies that support net zero, including carbon pricing. Uh, so then individuals uh, in remuneration, incentivizing the workforce, to deliver these aims through uh, their financial remuneration, and that's already taken place, it started in 2020. Uh, number eight, set expectations on relationships with trade associations. And you may have seen, uh, we published last week, a trade association report, and we have uh, exited three trade associations where we just are not quite aligned on, um, on the future aspirations. Uh, number nine, transparency and reporting, and uh, supporting the task force on uh, climate-related financial disclosures and being you know, as transparent as we possibly can. And number 10, and this is actually one of the most interesting ones, um, launch a new team to create integrated clean energy and mobility opportunities for governments, for cities, for entities to help the world decarbonize. So all of that is, is exciting, it's new, uh, it's uncertain, and we'll be publishing more information on how we're going to do this in September. Um, but I just wanted to say that underpinning these commitments is CCUS. That's one of the three big levers, along with uh, hydrogen and some other climate solutions that will help us deliver these aims and our ambition. Perfect, thank you. Okay, Gina, let's go over to you. Um, you've, as I said earlier, arrived in September or August in DC. And I mean, we all know here, I think that Equinor is really a leader in CCS in Europe. So you've also, I think a month ago, launched new commitments. So tell us a bit more how you're evolving into this energy company, bolstering renewables via offshore wind, but also obviously capitalizing on your CCS expertise and developing the future of natural gas. Thank you for uh, inviting Equinor and uh, Norwegian uh, to this panel. Um, Equinor is uh, committed to be a leader in the energy transition. And a couple of years ago, uh, we reshaped our strategy and portfolio to be in line with the Paris Agreement. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we came out with our new climate ambitions, which are to be uh, carbon neutral uh, by 2030, we will uh, increase renewables tenfold by 2026. And we also take a full life cycle perspective on emissions. Uh, and we have uh, set an ambition to reduce uh, uh, the net zero uh, by 50% by uh, 2050. So that will uh, take uh, Equinor uh, in a full alignment with the Paris Agreement. So what can we do? And I think uh, the next decade will be critical if we are to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And I think there are, I have an optimistic view. Uh, I think it's doable, but we have to act now. And I, the industry is playing a critical role, as well as governments and, uh, and society. We need collaboration. 
let's uh, highlight a few uh, approaches uh, that I see is uh, important to mitigate climate change. First, uh, we have to switch from coal to gas. Let's not forget that. If all coal-fired power plants were replaced by gas, we could reduce emissions by 5 billion tons. Renewables. We must expand within renewables. Equinor is about to build an offshore wind uh, farm outside of New York. Soon, an oil and gas company like Equinor will power 1 million New York homes with uh, power from the offshore wind. And I think that says a lot about our transition as a company. Uh, we are also going to build the first offshore wind farm that will power parts of oil and gas installations in the North Sea in Norway. CCS. CCS is still the most effective and powerful tool to mitigate climate change. Equinor has experience from Europe. We have stored uh, 23 million tons of CO2 in the North Sea the last two decades. And we are now uh, in collaboration with the Norwegian government uh, who is investigating a full-scale CCS value chain. We have been awarded the contract for the storage element. We can come back to that maybe with our partners uh, Shell and Total. And uh, that is the most exciting thing uh, in Europe for now, where we could accommodate for third party uh, CO2 and have a European uh, value chain for CCS. I will come back to more in the discussion, but uh, to round off, um, I think we uh, have to be on the right side of history. We have to act now. We need to collaborate. That's why Equinor as well is engaging with, uh, within OGCI, the US CEO climate dialogue, uh, and we are meeting with senators and members uh, every month uh, to advocate for a price on carbon, to boost CCS and to boost innovation. And uh, we are committed to share our experience, even data, uh, to meet uh, new ambitious climate targets that uh, we see across the world. Thank, thank you, perfect. Quick follow-up question actually, have we heard anything from the test well drill in the for the Northern Lights project? There was rec recently a test well um, drilled in, in the North the Norwegian shelf to, for offshore storage. Is there anything new on this? No, there's uh, no news yet, but we, uh, you are right, we just drilled a uh, confirma confirmation well in the North Sea, the Johansson Formation, and that is very, very exciting. Thank you. All right, let's go come back to the U U.S. and really exciting um, developments in the U.S., particularly as a, as a result of 45Q. Rich, can you tell us a little bit about um, which applications, which business models, which new trends really were have been driven by 45Q since it was enacted about two years ago? Sure. And firstly, and the whole institute, thanks so much for having me. And thanks in particular for not sitting me right next to Julio, because my boring, you know, DC getup always kind of pales in comparison to his. If folks haven't seen him on CNBC Squawk Box, that very bolo tie has appeared on international television while talking about CCS. Um, and that actually, I think, is just a good indication of how far we've come, right? In the wake of the Microsoft direct air capture announcement, there was someone on CNBC talking about the enormous economic opportunity that is carbon capture, carbon innovation, and direct air capture. That really would not have happened 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, or five years ago. Um, so 45Q really has changed everything. It's hugely changed the debate here. Uh, it's opened up an entirely new realm of dialogue. It's brought a number of new participants into the table. Um, you know, uh, Shannon and Kirk and Frank at the National Carpet Center, and so many others for so long were saying, you know, this should be a bigger conversation. There are a lot of other emitting sectors that should be talking about this. It shouldn't be a coal only conversation. We should be bringing more in. And I think that that has really occurred now. And so, and now as we've seen this wave of project announcements that have come out in the wake of 45Q, the preponderance of those have actually been in the industrial sector, right? And so it's ethanol facilities and ammonia facilities and cement facilities and direct air capture units, right? These are the things that have most immediately announced um, that they're gonna come out, along with a lot of development on the coal power side and the gas power side, um, but it's really broadened the conversation. And we understand that there's gonna be a wave of announcements of alum, cycle natural gas um, uh, uh, developments and projects, 
uh, potentially even in the coming weeks, which is very, very exciting. Um, we started now to break in on the policy side into appropriations for other um, uh, forms of CCS projects. And so there have now been appropriations in this last bill for gas with CCS. There's a lot of interest now in this bill, the FY21 spending bill, in doing appropriations for industrial CCS. Um, obviously, the NPC study has really shown the, you know, the U.S. oil and gas industry, the global oil and gas industry, sort of coming forward in this in a more forceful way. So it's just that it's been a huge broadening of the conversation and I just want to talk very quickly about sort of two large follow-on pieces of policy that are now coming up. The first is the Senate Energy Bill, uh, which everyone here should be excited about. It's hitting the floor uh, maybe as we as we speak this, this very afternoon. Um, that bill will get the U.S. back into major CCS demonstrations and cost shares for those demonstrations, uh, which have really been a, a bit dormant since the completion of the Petronova uh, project, which, which went very well a couple of years ago. So that bill would authorize five new major CCS demonstrations in the next five years with a balanced portfolio across both coal and natural gas fired power plants. In addition, it would set up a new line in the Department of Energy to start focusing on industrial emissions and industrial CCS as well for the first time. That's been sort of a, a tacked on afterthought at DOE, but also very exciting that it'll be added in. And there's significant new support in that in a formal authorized way to start you know, uh, direct air capture um, programs in a much larger way with a much higher uh, funding authorization um, at DOE as well. So a really exciting, again, expansion of this opportunity to all of these additional sectors. And that's been mirrored on the House side as well. So, you know, I think uh, you know, two, two or three years ago, right, we, we you know, uh, Republicans in the House not talking so much about climate, you know, a, a, a huge win on getting 45Q passed in early 2018, but a, frankly, a bit of a struggle. So fast forward to today and uh, leader, the first leg of Leader McCarthy's climate package announced two weeks ago with real legislation introduced included a permanent extension of the 45Q tax incentive with even higher levels for direct air capture of CO2 and other bills which would set up CCS hubs around the country and expand natural gas uh, uh, CCS and demonstrations um, uh, as well, sort of under the leadership of Dan Crenshaw, um, in addition to other sort of natural climate solution bills. So, so really carbon capture and deep active federal role in incentivizing carbon capture has become you know, the leading edge of uh, Republicans' uh, climate proposition now as, as House Republicans are coming out on this. So, and, and really I attribute so much of this to that breakthrough that was uh, 45Q and making all of this much more, you know, real live opportunity. Perfect, and just to provide some numbers from our global status of CCS report, and Andrew actually showed this slide earlier, which I think is the best slide in the entire report. The global CCS facilities pipeline is up 37% since 2017 and capacity is actually up by 51% since 2017. So this is a result of governments embracing CCS within their climate strategy, climate and innovation strategies. So taking this as a basis, how do we build more trust and more support for further CCS deployment? And then also what are maybe in the US specifically, um, the next steps in terms of high level priorities for CCS deployment and to get steel in the ground and to get steel in the ground to the levels that we need. I think it was earlier mentioned at the Institute, we would like to reference that a sustainable development scenario, roughly 2,000, 2,400 facilities by 2040, or as Brad likes to say, a hundred fold scale up. So would you, would you like to start, Perlio? <laughs> Just a couple of, of quick thoughts on that. Um, Andrew made a pretty impassioned plea right off the bat for coalition building. Uh, and need to do a shout out for the Great Plains Institute and C2ES, which put 45Q over the, you know, into the mainstream in the first place. And they built a coalition that included everybody from labor unions to oil and gas companies to NGOs to philanthropies like ClearPath and put all of that into practice. Like that, that everybody came to me and was like, hey, 45Q, this happened overnight. And I was like, no, it happened after seven years of hard pouring <laughs> boards and coalition building. But like that, we have to keep doing that. And in that context, there's a couple of things that I think are important in terms of keeping momentum. One of them is to overcome uh, what I could refer to as the trust gap between society and environmental groups and industry. Uh, in my many conversations, the conclusion I draw is that everybody's from Missouri, show me. 
They want to see commitments of cash, they want to see deployment of infrastructure, and they want to see CO2 going underground, and that will convince people that companies are serious about this. And uh, I think that there is uh, already been some ratcheting up of ambition inside of companies, not all companies, not uniformly, perhaps not to the level at which others would like to see. I think that is something to continue to strengthen and pursue. In that exact context, a lot of the policy options that are out there are not big universal prices on carbon kind of policies, but are immensely helpful. Getting access to the subsurface, getting access to pore volumes, huge deal in the United States, something a lot of governors can do with a swipe of their pen, almost never talked about. Same thing for building CO2 pipelines. Getting that common carrier infrastructure would make a huge, huge difference and get another couple of dozen projects off the boards immediately. That's something, again, that states and cities and, and also the federal government can play a role in, but passing the Use It Act or the Invest CO2 Act is actually a little easier than getting the universal price on carbon. It's something actionable where, again, you can build coalitions around that and get that stuff over the top and get that stuff enacted. The last thing I would put in place there, and this is one of my personal favorites, is just procurement. Every clean energy technology started with government procurement. All of them did. LEDs, batteries, solar panels, they all started with government procurements. We could be doing that. The government could just go out and buy direct air capture removal services. They could buy cement and steel made with CCS. They can just do that, and it can be done through the Army Corps of Engineers or the Highway Bill or some other thing, which is politically invisible, but actually allows contracts to get into place and that those contracts can then be used to cover the cost for financing projects. Like, that's where we're at right now. And, and I'm, I'm enthusiastic about the fact that we're starting to see these things come together and these coalitions build. Perfect. Kina, please. And then Rich, of course. I think it's um, critical with coalition building and transparency. Uh, last month, um, we were part of a new portal uh, for sharing information on uh, uh, data sets uh, for storage in the Sleipner field. And uh, to uh, demonstrate that CO2 can be stored uh, safely. Um, I also believe that uh, we have to speak about hydro hydrogen and uh, that CCS is an enabler for hydrogen as well. Equinor is uh, part of four hydrogen demonstrators uh, in uh, Europe, in the UK, Germany and the Netherlands. And uh, that, that is something we, uh, we have to uh, make the case for. And finally, commercial models and incentives. It would be very exciting to see um, how, how it goes with the uh, Northern Lights project, which we expect a investment decision for later this year. Uh, so, the, and also uh, share uh, learnings and information from the hydrogen uh, demonstrated projects that are ongoing. Um, just to, to build on the point about sort of trust and transparency and, and Julio's point about procurement, we should all remember that a, a significant driver that really scaled up renewables in the United States, largely wind, right? So, so 20 gigawatts of renewables in the United States were built due to corporate procurements, corporate commitments to source uh, their electricity from renewables. Um, now, we and many other organizations are engaged in an effort to try and broaden those corporate commitments to be beyond just renewables and to go to either 24-7 clean or just more broadly clean energy commitments which would encompass potentially including CCS. I do think that there's a massive opportunity now, especially in the wake of all of these utility commitments to go to zero carbon, for every, every oil and gas company in the United States, really around the world, should have its own commitment to purchase all of its electricity from CCS fire power plants, right? That would be a massive, uh, commitment um, to procure a lot of electricity, which would really help do this, and it's the same model that really helped us help scale up uh, large-scale renewable projects. And just a couple of additional points on, you know, sort of trust. Uh, you've heard several references to the circular economy and the conversations that we've had in Riyadh and before that, and and. Um, you know, one of the things that's kind of scary is, you know, carbon capture and storage, and, and Julio's been coaching me on this, because we're both geoscientists, and, um, you know, if we could actually help people understand that, that maybe part of this circular um, process is returning CO2 to the earth, 
um, it, you know, rather than just sort of shoving it in there and doing all kinds of malicious uh, things, that we're actually sort of completing a process. You know, maybe that helps people understand, you know, sort of the the recycling, or um, as Julio is teaching me to say, you know, carbon capture and return rather than carbon capture and storage. Um, I do think the whole idea of transparency is really, really critical, and to where we can without jeopardizing business models, uh, you know, sharing, uh, sharing data, maybe going as far as open source, especially when government uh, or foundational funding is, is a part of that, will be critical. And uh, just you know, sort of helping people move along. And then, you know, one of the things, so speaking with one voice and not confusing people, I think is really important. One of the joys of the National Petroleum Council study was to be able to align our conversations, align our priorities, and to actually be able to step forward, um, you know, sort of as, as one coalition of over 300 people from around the world representing industries uh, such as cement, oil and gas, um, steel, finance, academia, government, and uh, others. So that, I think that one voice uh, leaving people not confused and also uh, being kind of mutually supportive. But another piece that I heard, people, like they love to bash each other. And so, you know, that technology is not going to work. This one will. Stop that. I mean, you know, we love all the kids equally. I'm sounding like you now. Um, <laughs> but not as eloquent. But, you know, it, it, there is something about really leaving stakeholders uh, engaged or you can leave them confused. And I think when we try to, uh, you know, sort of cut out the acronyms, stop using a lot of com complicated terminology, and it's an and conversation. We can uh, move forward with incentives. We can do really blue sky technology. And it's not an and or it's not an or. And this one's going to fail and this one's going to work. You know, just sort of all of the above uh, is what we need an alignment of all of the players. I su subscribe to that. And I think this industry, we, we have to be better at listening and to engaging in real dialogues, not just talking to people. So I fully support you, uh, Cindy, and uh, we need more aspirational, uh, open uh, conversations, uh, and we have a huge responsibility representing the oil and gas sector. Thank you. I really appreciate, Cindy, your very passionate points about um, an all-of-the-above approach, because at the Institute, we like to say we, we hate pitting technologies against each other, and it's really an you know, and, not an or approach, especially with it being 2020 and 2050 only 30 years away. Um, so I'd like to dr drill down on two points here that we've heard. Infrastructure. What is the, you know, thinking of C the U.S. being the leader in CCS deployment, um, 10 of 19 projects globally are in the uni United States. 45Q is the most progressive CCS-specific incentive, according to our analysis at the, the Institute. So what do we really need in terms of infrastructure in the United States CO2 transportation infrastructure and geologic storage infrastructure to accelerate hubs and cluster development, bring down the cost, achieve economies of scale, and um, really have this scale up um, that's needed globally. And then the second point is hydrogen, but we'll talk about this right after. Would like to start, Julio? So the uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab did a study years ago just trying to scope out the basic infrastructure we need. And their punchline was, you need about 20,000 miles of CO2 pipelines to get almost all of it. It's not that much. And today we've got 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines, so it's really not all that much. Most of this is not in big transcontinental CO2 pipeline networks. You're talking about small regional transport networks, a couple of hundred kilometers at, at the largest. And that's gonna cover an awful lot of your nut. Um, however, almost every project looks at that kind of infrastructure as a deadweight cost. They just can't say yes to something they don't think that they operate and own. And it's a big hassle to go outside of their business lane to build that kind of infrastructure. So I subscribe to something called Ohm's Law of Finance. Ohm's Law of Finance, money is like voltage, it overcomes resistance. That's why it's called currency. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and the punchline here is someone has to pay for the infrastructure. It's not that complicated, and that ends up 
almost always being some government engagement, and there needs to be some coalition building to get that done. But again, a lot of that's local or regional. Um, there's a number of projects that are going on that are philanthropically sponsored to look at, say, just around the Gulf region, say, just around the city of Houston or just around Louisiana, and say, where can we build some local infrastructure and take advantage of our geological resources? The same conversations are happening in California and Wyoming and in the central part of the country and to get all of the ethanol plants in Iowa. And that kind of conversation is really essential to get this stuff up and running. I'm feeling very brave following Julio, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, just I'll put on the NPC hat, and we did um, a piece of modeling of sort of uh, cost and um, abate, abatement modeling, and uh, we sort of tried to build the U.S. up to at scale deployment. You, Mr. Dr. At scale, um, which we said would be capturing about 20 percent of emissions from uh, U.S. stationary sources, and that was sort of modeling 800, 850 um, sort of discrete sources and taking them to sinks. And so the study itself builds off uh, from, as Jason said, sort of the, the lowest hanging fruit that will be catalyzed by, um, by 45Q and uh, reducing uncertainty on things like plastics wells and poor space ownership, and then builds up to probably projects that won't be unlocked without further incentivization, uh, financial incentivization. And so what, with regard to infrastructure, what came out of that, um, out of that study was actually um, a, a significant growth of infrastructure, especially in the, the out years, sort of the next 20 years or so, which is roughly equivalent uh, in terms of our, our uh, modeling to maybe sort of three quarters of the U.S. oil and gas pipeline infrastructure uh, that exists today. So we saw um, you know, about a $28 billion investment in infrastructure to move to this at-scale deployment uh, with significant uh, billions, multi hundreds of billions of dollars investment into to all aspects of building that, but creating businesses, creating jobs, and uh, creating the CCS carbon capture that we we need to move forward as a society. Rich, do you want to say anything? Okay. Um, For once. <laughs> Keenan? Hydrogen? Sure. Let's talk hydrogen. Okay, sounds great. Um, yes, so it's... Brad and Andrew actually alluded to this earlier. Um, all around the world, we're seeing countries um, formulate hydrogen strategy, and to put it um, in, in the words of our global status report, um, I think hydrogen hasn't seen as much attention um, in decades as it has seen in 2019. So in the US, there's always this big question, as Brad elaborated, how can we harness the development or the pressing need to deploy CCS to also scale and commercialize hydrogen. So maybe, you know, you can give us a little bit of an overview of what the European approach is to this and how it differs from the U.S. And then maybe, um, Julio, you can chime in with anything you haven't said on hydrogen yet. And I think it's a lot, so. <laughs> well, I can share with you some uh, high-level uh, thinking from uh, Europe. Hydrogen is increasingly seen as the world's uh, destination fuel. And I see, uh, we see uh, CCS uh, as an enabler uh, for hydrogen. Uh, we are currently involved in four hydrogen uh, demonstrator projects. And it's about uh, repurposing infrastructure so you can carry low carbon energy in the existing uh, infrastructure. And one of the projects is also to uh, see how we can decarbonize uh, full industry clusters in the UK. Very, very exciting. But the main point is that uh, blue hydrogen is uh, blue hydrogen technologies are available at a gigawatt scale today. So uh, let's uh, look at the incentives to uh, stimulate these kind of demonstration projects and. Uh, uh, be aware that CCS is actually a fast tracker to get to uh, the hydrogen of the future. So hydrogen has the bonus property that when you burn it, it burns at 2100 degrees Celsius. That's pretty much hot enough for anything. 
Um, well, it matters because you know if you're going to make concrete, that happens at 1450 degrees Celsius. If you're going to make steel, that happens at 1200 degrees Celsius. That's actually really hard to get any other way. And so the good news is it does the job. So the question is just how do you make the molecules? And again, we know this. Um, the uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance put out a pretty interesting report. There's a whole bunch of other reports that have looked at when you get the low-cost green hydrogen coming into the system. And it's somewhere between 2030 and 2050, and these guys all say, hopefully by that time, we can get to a buck 50 a kilogram for green hydrogen. And I always raise my hand in the back and say, we can already do 150 a kilogram for blue hydrogen, we're doing it today. We're doing it today at Quest, and we're doing it today in Othmania, and we're doing it today at Emirates Steel, and we're doing it today in Port Arthur. Like, we're already hitting that target. And it's not to be a knock on green hydrogen. Take this away, if there's only one thing you remember from this, we can't talk about green, we can't talk about blue hydrogen, we need to breed an aquaculture. That's gotta be where we go. It's gotta be an aquaculture, we like blue and green together. And at, at the end of the day though, like we are already in pole position in terms of cost and performance. Let's do it today and build the on-ramps and build the infrastructure and build the off-takes. To get the industry going though, I humbly disagree with people who think really it's about sort of light duty vehicles, it's not. Um, I think we can make some progress with heavy duty vehicles, that's a good place to start. But already for some applications like buses, for a city like New York, hydrogen buses make sense, but for a city like Los Angeles, electric buses make sense. They're like it's okay, you can have both of these things and that's fine. For really heavy duty vehicles, probably not for long haul, probably not, probably hydrogen is your destination. But there's two killer apps for hydrogen and it's already started. One of them is shipping. You can't make an electric ship, period. Can't do it. Can't get across the Pacific on batteries. Can't. So you need a fuel that has zero carbon in it. Hydrogen is pretty hard to put into one of those ships. Ammonia is not. Ammonia is pretty easy and it's made out of hydrogen. <laughs> that's, that's the way to go. For the record, the ETC group that, that Andrew Spear mentioned earlier, the Mission Possible people, had an interesting statistic. They said, hey, if you want to make shipping fuels out of ammonia, you can do that. If you want to make it all with green hydrogen, you have to quadruple the world's grid just to make that. So maybe blue hydrogen is a better way to think about that in terms of getting into shipping. Half of the engines on ships in the world today can use hydrogen. Half of them. You can just go, you can launch on that, for real. And guess what, ports have their own authorities. They can levy fees, they can issue bonds, they can condemn subsurface. Ports today can do a lot of the heavy lifting around this stuff that we're talking about. But the real killer app here is heavy industry. And we're starting to see that, especially in steel. ThyssenKrupp is doing a pilot where they're putting hydrogen into a blast furnace. They're taking out the coal, they're putting in hydrogen. That's pretty good. You can get 20% decarbonization with that. You can go even faster and further in petrochemicals. A lot of petrochemical plants already use hydrogen as a heating fuel. Ethylene crackers have byproduct hydrogen that's generally captured and reused in the plant. That means they have sensors and controls, they have ductworks, they have burners, they have all the things you need to start putting that stuff into the system. And by the way, they also have tons of natural gas coming into those plants, so you have a pretty ready place to start. Here again, the question is who pays? How do you incent that stuff? How do you get that stuff going? And there's only three people who ever pay. Rate payers, shareholders, and taxpayers. That's it. Those are the only sources of money in the world. That's okay. We can think about policies that provide ways to bring that money in off the sidelines and get the hydrogen deployed in the systems. Thank you. Just want to make one comment that pulls together these conversations about hydrogen and infrastructure. I think over the past six months, one thing I've observed from a number of conversations, particularly with the natural gas distribution and transmission community, uh, is around the, the biggest infrastructure number, at least in the US, which is the $5 trillion of natural gas infrastructure we already have in the ground. And so I think a couple of things have come together. A lot of utilities have made these commitments to go 100% clean, and then folks are asking them immediately, well, is that your, is that your electricity or is that also your natural gas? Most of them don't immediately have a great answer to that question. There's a, a growing concern about a continuing social license to use natural gas in a distributed way in buildings for boilers and heating and all that stuff. Um, there's a feeling there's an opportunity around 45Q and there's a feeling that these pushes to stop 
the further extension of natural gas into homes and communities and places like Berkeley and all of California <coughs> could be really problematic. Because again, when you look at that $5 trillion number and you think, well, wow, what if I had to build an electrical infrastructure to electrify everything, right, to replace that $5 trillion of assets and pipes in the ground with a whole lot of additional um, electrical connection? You know, we're talking about a multi trillion dollar electrical investment to do all of that. And so it's led to, I think, this really interesting broadening of the conversation, um, which unfortunately has started at renewable gas, which a lot of people think is sort of a panacea, but actually becomes a tiny part of the problem. And then people are realizing, okay, we'll, we'll have to be a mix. Renewable gas, renewable hydrogen, blue hydrogen, syn gas, all kinds of other things. But obviously CCS will play an enormous role in many of the solutions in that bucket. Thank you. I appreciate this comment. And actually, I have a follow-up question for you um, along the lines of natural gas and infrastructure. You've been tracking at ClearPath and analyzing utility commitments in the U.S., which has really taken off. Um, I think there's now multiple, many. I actually don't know the number. You do, I think. Um, how, what is the role of CCS in these utility commitments that we've seen and these util net zero utility commitments? So, um, so uh Smart Electric Power Association, I believe, has the definitive tracker of all this, and they've got it on their website and a map, and it's now a surprisingly large section of the country that is covered by green in this map, of a utility that has made some kind of a deep decarbonization commitment. I believe we're up to 38 investor-owned utilities that have made those commitments, and I believe of those, 13 are some, some formulation of net zero or zero carbon or near zero emissions, and, and more to come. It's almost been a month by month sort of cadence over the past uh, 18 months or so of somebody making a new, pretty aggressive commitment. Dominion was the most recent of these. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm out of date. Consumers in Michigan was actually the most recent of these just, just last week in Dominion, a couple of weeks before. Um, so what's also very interesting about these commitments is starting with Excel in December of 2018, who really kicked off the fresh round of these and said, we're gonna get to net zero by 2050. We know exactly how we're gonna to get to our 80% reduction by 2030. We're gonna keep deploying the existing technologies we have. We're gonna build a lot more wind and solar and sun batteries, and we're gonna do a lot more oil to gas switching. We have very little idea how we're gonna get the last 20% of the way. And Excel is, you know, Colorado and the Mountain West, literally the most renewables abundant part of the country. So the problem that for Excel is the last 20% of emissions for a lot of the rest of the country, especially the folks in the Southeast who have you know, relatively just a paucity of local renewable resources, that might be the last 50% of the problem for somebody like Southern or Duke in, you know, in, in that kind of service territory. And so for each of them, they're saying, well, not only are we committing to 100% clean, we're making some kind of deep interim target by 2030, but we're also committing to get really involved the federal energy innovation conversation because we all know that we're going to need something to go that last mile. So Duke, I think, very charmingly calls it the Zelfer, the zero emission load following energy resource. They need one. They really just need one. Ideally, they'd have a portfolio of them, right? But gas with CCS, coal with CCS, advanced nuclear reactors, further uh, deployment of hydropower and enhanced geothermal, all of these things are on the table. And the utility industry is actually coming together to start jointly collaborating on the federal energy innovation uh, policy um, platform in a way that they really haven't um, over the last couple of years. So it's pretty exciting. That's great. Just to emphasize that the last 20% doesn't mean you can wait until 2030 to deploy CCS. Right? Yeah, ab absolutely, right? Absolutely. And so, and, and, and all of them are very much realizing that, which is why folks are so excited about this potential wave of demonstration projects. Uh, you know, now if it would if it were to come out of this energy bill, if you figure you need, you need sort of a decade to demonstrate a lot of this stuff, you need another decade to start early scale up so that you could actually get to mass deployment in the 2040s. If I can add to that, the, this kind of activity in the utility sector and also in policy at the state level has shown the value of these kind of coalitions. Going to clean targets instead of renewable targets allowed two things. It allowed a higher ambition and it, it opened the aperture to have a wider coalition because renewable portfolio standards explicitly said, oh, hydro, nuclear, CCS, you're out. <laughs> like, and so they were limited in terms of their ambition and their aperture. Now with the, you're able to have 100%, which is the right target, that's the science-based target, and you're allowed to have this wider group of people all pulling in your favor. That, 
has revealed, again, this idea that the arithmetic is important. It has also ended up where we should have started 20 years ago. Because we should have started the conversation on carbon 20 years ago, and instead we've had 20 years of talking about kilowatt hours and dollars per gallon as opposed to dollars per ton. We've been the only people who've talked about dollars per ton this whole time. But that's actually the measure now. The curve people are being graded on is not how many renewables do they build. The grade people are being graded on today is how many tons do they reduce. And that's the right measure. And to get there, we still have a long way to go in terms of analysis, in terms of policy, in terms of technology. But it, it, it shows one really important trend, which is that the happy talk is over. We're now in a position where we have to be clear-eyed in order to get on this path about what does it take to actually get to zero. And that kind of arithmetic is a very, very strong uh, weapon we have in our court. Perfect, thank you. So before we go to the audience question, question, and you can keep your microphone in your hand because we're gonna do a quick lightning round. Um, in a few weeks, the Global CCS Institute is releasing a new report value of CCS to society. So in maximum three words, lightning round, so really quick. Um, what's the value of CCS to society? It's 45Q, one or two words, just so I can remember. That's one. Okay, great. Do you want to start? McCarthy Permanent 45Q. Uh, CCS is needed to accelerate solutions towards uh, uh, reduced emissions. Okay. Ten words, perfect. <laughs> that was hyphenated. Um, so the NPC uh, strap tagline we use is two words, CCUS, good. Get the tons for cash. And I say jobs. Okay. Let's go to Q&A. Thank you, everyone. This has been a really terrific discussion. Um, do we have any questions in the audience? I guess don't. I kind of had the feeling that we answered everything <laughs> proactively. There's nothing left to cover. Oh. Please state your name and your organization. <clears throat> Jeff Epping with MHS LLC. The debate of clean energy versus renewable is, is that really uh, been one? I was at a meeting uh, a couple of days ago where uh, the discussion was all around renewable energy as opposed to clean energy, uh, removing carbon being the goal. Where do you think that debate really stands? I would say, unfortunately, it's far from one. I think we've had a number of significant uh, victories on sort of our side on, on opening up the conversation. I think if you just look at the, you know, in, in the past uh, year and a half, the number of states that now, when they have taken action in terms of a portfolio standard of some kind, they've done it as a sort of a higher ambition clean energy standard, right? Uh, but often, though, they've sort of put in place a near term renewables target and then a long term, you know, CES target. So they still want to weight things toward renewables in the in the near renewables only in the near term and usually the justification for that is something like uh, well these are the things that are more cost competitive so it just makes sense to weight it toward renewables in the near term which is kind of circular reasoning right because like if they were so cost competitive they would win under a CES in the near term you wouldn't need to weight the table for it right so there I think there's still a lot of folks that that quietly want to see that construct and so I think it's still important for us to continuously sell this message that you know to Julio's point we need to be thinking in terms of of tons and dollars per ton and cost effectiveness and broad open aperture on the technologies. Um, but I do think that we're making significant progress. I wouldn't say the battle's won yet, though. Um, I, th I think this is a great question. And uh, I believe the debate is a bit too black and white. Uh, I I'm hoping for a more nuanced uh, discussion. Uh, too many people think that we could uh, shut down oil and gas and uh, turn over to renewables tomorrow. That is not a fact. We need an energy transition. That means you need both decarbonization stra strategies and technologies, as well as a uh, step up in uh, renewable investments. And that is uh, certainly Equinor's uh, approach. And I think the whole idea of trust Coming in here, um, you know, our, our previous CEO made a great statement a couple years ago at Sarah Week, and he's like, oh my gosh, I've just realized it's not a race to renewables, it's about a race to reduce emissions. And I think if you can get alignment of that, it makes perfectly good sense. I mean, what everyone up here is saying is so logical. You broaden your, you open your toolkit, and you're much more inclusive. 
But I, I still think, um, speaking as someone from an oil and gas industry, we don't have the trust, and we haven't we haven't built the trust, and people sort of want to not not uh, appreciate us as part of the solution. So we have a long way to go to help people uh, understand that this is all um, this is all part of energy provision, not just one sector saying trust us or be be with us. So a couple of quick thoughts. Uh, first of all, Twitter is one of the guilty pleasures of the 21st century. And I'm a huge fan and I love it, but it ain't reality at all. And, and it is easy to succumb to the shrill voices at both ends of the dumbbell, which is what's rewarded in the social media and real media context today, but it isn't reality. It's not how investors make decisions. It's not how governments make laws. And, and it's not how boards invest their money. Like that's where this conversation ha has already, I think, shifted substantively to just thinking about an all of the above approach. Um, and, and again, if you're a fan of uh, improv comedy, we have already gone from an either or solution to a yes and solution. And you know, yes, renewables can. And so uh, in civil society, when I talk to people, I'm like, well, of course we need more renewables and of course we need more efficiency, and of course we need more conservation, of course we need more batteries. Um, I have been bothered by the disingenuous actors out there who insist that you can do it all when they've shaved off a gear in their head that does arithmetic in order to assert that it can be done all with renewables. And I think we have to call people out on that on a special case-by-case basis and ask them stuff like, how are you going to get cement? Like, really? How are you going to do that? How are you going to get fertilizer? We don't, we don't know how to unemit from the land use of fertilizer. How are you going to get that? And uh, we just have to be asking questions of these people to, to make it clear that they actually can't answer all the questions. They make assertions. That's fine. We have knowledge. We have arithmetic. These are good tools in our toolkit. Perfect. Thank you. We have a question. In the back, Russell. Hi, uh, yeah, Russell Bike from uh, Carbon Direct. So, Julio, you made a great point uh, that there's only three people who pay for these things the, the rate payer, uh, the taxpayer, or the government. So, the government's putting money towards carbon capture and storage. Uh, the taxpayer is a 45Q. Could, could one of you talk a little bit about how you think the rate payer would be able to get included in the funding? So, and is there anything in the, in the upcoming uh, Senate or House bill that's going to try to reverse that? So at the risk of stealing Rich's thunder, uh, it's not just the rate payer or the taxpayer, it's also the shareholder. That's another place where there's money in the world. But, but for the rate payer, a clean portfolio standard in energy automatically enables the rate payer. So now that California has gone to 100% clean power standard, they can now permit CCS projects to put them in the rate case. And they couldn't do that two years ago, but they can now. And the same thing for the other eight states that have done that. Also in the Clean Futures Act, within Title II, um, it, it, it sets what the emissions limit is for clean power, so if you do a project below that emissions limit, you're enabled by law, if that, if that ever becomes enacted, to do that. Uh, also in the smith Luhan uh, original proposal there, they also basically provided uh, that mechanism for rate recovery, again, with 100% clean. I think Julio almost entirely stole my thunder there. I'll, I'll <laughs> add one thing, on one thing, which is uh, this really interesting model uh, in Colorado, um, which is under active consideration in the Colorado Senate, which would not only let people rate-based things in compliance with, uh, in Colorado it's not exactly a CES, it's a, it's a sort of a shadow price in the PUC, but in addition to that, it would actually let them rate-base innovative technology demonstrations, right? Which is something that could sort of goes above and beyond, right? So, you know, typically PUCs are just looking at, you know, low, lowest cost, most reliable, and in compliance with whatever other rule. So then if you want to go a step beyond that and say, well, I've got this new cool thing that I would also love to, you know, put out there. Usually the PUC is like, no, no way. We, we don't want to, we don't want to sort of play around with large technology demonstrations, but this would actually encourage um, that, um, you know, in, in a bounded way um, uh, in, in Colorado. And I think that could be a really interesting thing. And I actually expect if Colorado does go forward with that, especially if it, it makes them more competitive as participants in this wave of new demonstration projects that will come out as a result of the 
hopefully we'll pass the Senate Energy Bill, um, uh, and that, you know, hopefully we'll pass the House as well. Uh, other states may follow suit and develop their own mechanisms to sort of let their ratepayers put up some of that cost share with the feds so that they can grab um, you know, some of these 17 new interesting projects. Russ, one other quick add to that. Some of the bills out there have direct air capture overtly as a compliance mechanism. And they say, you can get down to whatever, if you emit anything above that, you can comply with direct air capture and carbon core storage. And it's possible that that aperture might widen to <coughs> stuff like BEX or mineralization or some other thing. Um, but, but in point of fact, these kinds of compliance mechanisms are another very strong lever. And let me give you a, a local example from New York. Um, there is a new law in place from the city council called Local 97 that requires all buildings above 25,000 square feet to do an audit of their carbon footprint. And by 2030, they have to be net zero or pay 287 bucks a ton. 287 bucks a ton is a lot of money for a landlord. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Well, if they could do direct air capture as a compliance mechanism for that law, then they have a cheaper option in the future. And so these kinds of things I think are beginning to bubble up as the technologies mature and as the infrastructure matures. Fantastic. Uh, Jeff is signaling we're out of time. Um, I could have asked a million more questions, uh, especially on, around this discussion on shareholder and the role of green capital and green capital commitments, but I think Lauren will answer some of these questions in our panel later. So um, thank you very much. I think what really stuck with me today is that we need to build trust and the best way to do so is steal in the ground and demonstrate um, the safe and secure deployment of CCS at scale. And yes, please join me in thanking this fantastic panel and we're looking forward to